Hi everyone, I'm Chris Saldana, and this is the National Education Policy Center's Education Interview of the Month. This month, we're speaking with Dr. Shardé Bonilla and Dr. Allison Tintianco Kubales. Dr. Bonilla is an assistant professor in the College of Education at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. She is also the co-author of a recently published article entitled Ethnic Studies Increases Longer Run Academic Engagement and Attainment. Dr. Tintianco Kubales is a professor of Asian American Studies and a faculty member in the Educational Leadership Program at San Francisco State University. She is the author of several books and articles focusing on the development of ethnic studies curriculum and on community responsive pedagogy. Thank you both for being on the podcast. So Professor Tintianco Kubales, let me start with you. So what is ethnic studies and what is it designed to do? Um, ethnic studies is, for me, when I think about it, it's, it's my life. Um, it is really what has um, allowed me personally the opportunity to see myself with value. So when I think about ethnic studies, it's very personal. Um, I can give you a very stock definition, which I will do. But I wanted to start there because I think it's really important to discuss that ethnic studies really belongs to people, particularly people of color. Um, ethnic studies is really about telling our stories. When I say our, I'm talking about people of color in the first person. So ethnic studies is really about the stories of Black, Indigenous, Asian American, Latinx, um, and thinking particularly about Native people and their stories. But those stories are told in the first person. I want to keep reiterating first person. Um, that, that's key to making something ethnic studies. The other piece of ethnic studies is the goal of ethnic studies is really to eliminate racism. Um, it's really meant to address issues of oppression um, and be able to provide opportunities for resistance to oppression. And for many people, when they think about those people who were at the very beginning stages of developing ethnic studies in the late 60s, the goals were about access to education. It was about providing a relevant education to students, particularly students of color, and then really connecting education, the university, um, to community. And so we call that the ARC, Access, Relevance, and Community. So I imagine every ethnic studies curriculum is different. Um, so what was included in the California High School Ethnic Studies course and was that different than what was included in San Francisco? Um, so if, if we could start with San Francisco's curriculum, because that came first. Um, and so I, um, along with some amazing teachers in San Francisco Unified School District, were able to spend years, <laughs> many, many years, um, developing uh, San Francisco's curriculum. Um, so that has evolved over time. But some of the major concepts that were um, in the San Francisco curriculum were really this idea of um, understanding systems of oppression, being able to find ways to respond to those systems of oppression, um, looking at humanization as a main and core factor um, in trying to develop responses to oppression, um, looking at decolonization, that was very much central to the, the San Francisco curriculum, and then really interrogating hegemony um, and developing ways to think about counter hegemony. Um, also, what's in the San Francisco curriculum is this idea that we want students to be able to take what they what they are learning in the classroom and develop projects in their communities to better serve their communities. So San Francisco's curriculum, and, and I think there's many people who could speak to that with the different units, and um, but that's the main core factors and ideas, variables in, in the San Francisco curriculum. Um, and um, that influenced California's curriculum. And so initially, um, they brought together uh, three writers um, who uh, were able to develop um, a curriculum that focused on the introduction to ethnic studies. Um, and then provided um, lessons um, in particular areas, um, including African American studies, uh, Lat Latino, uh, Latino, La Latina um, American studies, Asian American studies, um, and Native American studies. And so there's lessons in all of those areas. 
Um, the curriculum that they provided um, was then uh, taken to a committee that I, I happened to be part of. I was one of the co-chairs of that committee. Um, and what we did with that curriculum that they wrote was really expand it and, and develop more ideas and make sure that those two main ideas when I described what ethnic studies was, was really coming through, like centralizing the experiences of people of color and really trying to make sure that the curriculum was able to respond to issues of racism. Um, and it was robust. It was a very, very long curriculum. Um, and I think the challenges, um, you know, like with the curriculum from the community, from the public, um, started to really happen after that, uh, that edited draft came out. So let me ask you about that. Cause you said this is a project that took years and, um, I imagine just like anything else that a school or a school district does, everyone has an opinion about how it should be shaped. So what were the political challenges that you experienced or that the committee experienced during the design, adoption and implementation of the high school ethnic studies curriculum? So I'll, I'll rewind a little bit and say that San Francisco's curriculum took, year, took years. Um, San Francisco's curriculum took years um, and has, is continuing to be edited because curriculum should respond to students. Um, and when students uh, learn a particular curriculum or um, get to experience it, we also want it, we also want to evaluate it from the student perspective and then be able to change it. So San Francisco's uh, curriculum uh, the, it had gone through many iterations because of the students and the teachers who who taught it. Um, California's curriculum was very different in terms of the process because it was a short amount of time. Um, uh, the California curriculum um, only had a couple of months um, before it went public. Um, and that that in some ways is dangerous because there was not enough time um, to really go in and make the changes necessary for it to be um, a strong curriculum um, for the public to view. Another one was um, that ethnic studies that was presented um, to the public um, was a curriculum that was rooted um, in the values of 1969, um, and some people really don't under didn't understand that um, that this the the center of California's curriculum was really about um, people of color, um, and and some people felt like that they wanted um, their stories to be told in that curriculum, um, but the main reason why ethnic studies ex exists is because. There is a need for people of color stories to be able to be centralized because we're not centralized in mainstream curriculum. Um, and so in some ways, it felt like people were co-opting ethnic studies. Um, people were, were trying to, um, to be part of ethnic studies. Um, and, and in some ways, it, it, it really diluted, you know, like the central idea that ethnic studies was really about the stories of people of color in the first person. Um, and so that was one of the political challenges. I know that there's been uh, that there's been controversy raised around ethnic studies courses that has come out of nowhere. It's like made up stuff. Um, it's like similar to this to the arguments and debates that are happening with CRT now. So I'm just wondering. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, what ethnic studies is and what it's designed to do, um, and we often hear people criticize it because they say it's racist against white people, or it makes people hate white people. Um, is ethnic studies either of those things? No, it's not. Um, ethnic studies is not about hating um, people or hating white people. Ethnic studies is really, again, about the stories of people of color in the first person um, and their experiences. And systems of oppression have impacted the experiences of people of color. They have experienced racism. Um, and that is not just personal experiences, um, it's also in policy. Um, and so if those things exist, that's part of American history. Um, and the idea is that we don't repeat those histories. And so ethnic studies allows us the opportunity to really think deeply about the systems that have impacted our lives, to figure out how we can have more liberatory systems. Um, how we can really make sure that people of color have the freedoms that they deserve. So, Professor Bonilla, let me turn to you. So what motivated you to study the effect of an ethnic studies course on academic achievement? 
Well, the motivation for doing this work was twofold. Uh, one was that um, as a graduate student at Stanford, uh, the university partners with uh, San Francisco Unified School District to do engaged partnership research um, around topics that the school district itself is really interested in and also that uh, complements the research interests of, of researchers at, at Stanford. And so that was sort of one impetus, which is that the school district was interested in finding out the answer, of course. Um, and the other is, I guess, my, my own background. I, I was particularly interested in this project because I attended a high school. Um, I attended Berkeley High School, which has had a long standing ethnic studies requirement. And so way back in the day, I took ethnic studies as a high school student. And so I was I was particularly interested in sort of trying to understand what might be the impacts of such a curriculum, um, particularly around around addressing um, students who have struggled with um, academic um, attendance and engagement with school. So I know one of the things that's hard to do with causal research is you have all of these things going on in the classroom, um, and it's hard to isolate that effect of, of the thing that you're studying. So how were you able to isolate uh, the causal effect of the ethnic studies course? It's a great question. So what we end up doing is using a really important strategy that the school district itself decided to use to prioritize student enrollment. So San Francisco Unified was particularly interested in supporting uh, students who had already struggled academically in middle school um, and, and targeting those students as part of their efforts for engaging and supporting um, kids in the transition to, to high school. And so what they did was they effectively decided that students who had a GPA of less than 2.0, so that would be less than a C average, would automatically get ethnic studies on their course schedule. Um, and then students who had a GPA higher than 2.0 did not have ethnic studies. Um, there's some caveats where that students were allowed to opt out. They had to sort of take an additional step and go see a counselor if they really didn't want to take ethnic studies. And similarly, students who really wanted to take ethnic studies could go see a counselor and make sure it ended up on their schedule. But what we focus on in our study is those students for whom ethnic studies showed up on their schedule, and because it showed up on their schedule, they ended up in the class, um, sort of by no... Um, decision of their own, but rather by this assignment policy. And so what we're able to do is utilize that to compare students who have these GPAs of less than 2.0 to students who have GPAs just above the 2.0 mark and sort of say students who have a 1.95, a 1.97 are effectively um, really similar to students who had a 2.01, 2.05. And so we compare these two sets of students who uh, were encouraged to enroll in ethnic studies and those who were not to look at their longer term success and engagement in high school. So what did you find? You know, I just want to say that these were really, these were surprisingly large results. Um, they surprised me. Um, we find that more than 90% of students graduated within five years compared to 75% of their peers. So that's a, that's a 15% difference in high school graduation rate. Um, in favor of those who were eligible for ethnic studies. Um, and they were also more likely to enroll in college five and six years after taking the course. Um, and this is just, the reason why this is surprising is because with many educational interventions, we see impacts when students are in the intervention. They're receiving the supports, they're being uh, sort of targeted um, and, and getting some additional um, you know, sort of help and, and so you see the impacts then, and then one year later, two years later, we just see fade out often in educational interventions. So when they're no longer sort of in it, um, it, it sort of starts to, to fade out and not have an impact. And that's very typical with many interventions from, you know, from, from Head Start, early childhood programs, to uh, tutoring programs, um, to efforts around sort of math achievement as well. So we often see some of that fade out. And here, um, not only do we see results that um, that are sustained, but they actually catalyze improvements later on. So we see that not only do students earn more credits during high school, but each year they build upon those gains. Um, so it's not just that they you know passed one more class in ninth grade and then 
we see that at the end of 12th grade, they pass one more class. We see that they pass one more class and that that sort of catalyzes into passing six more classes by the end of high school. And I think that's, it's sort of like you, you, um, you start sort of pushing a ball down a hill and sort of it picks up speed and sort of rolls um, faster and faster. And that sort of seems to be, I think, a really good metaphor for what this uh, ethnic studies pilot program did for, for eligible students. So given your findings, what would you say are the implications of your results for K-12 public schools? I, I think it's important to contextualize the findings. We leverage this design that focuses on academically at-risk kids in San Francisco in particular, right? So I think that the generalizability of these effects to all students is a really important but still open question uh, for other researchers to to um to sort of get involved with. Um, the, the ethnic and racial makeup of the students is also quite distinct. Uh, 60% of the students in our sample uh, were, were Asian, 23% um, you know, Latinx or, or Hispanic identifying. Um, and that sort of, and that is in contrast with only 6% of students were black and less than 5% were white. Um, the, the course itself was also, was also the curriculum targeted um, instances in um, sort of in in California history in particular, but also in national history around um, around school segregation, housing discrimination, immigration policy segregation against Asian and Latino Hispanic groups. That was sort of an emphasis in the curriculum. It also talked about Native American genocide, um, but but the the course was tailored to the fact that these that this was the ethnic racial makeup of the students being served. And I think that's an important caveat because it sort of, it speaks to the fact that if you sort of take this and try to copy it in another context, that the tailoring, I think, is an important aspect of the work. But otherwise, I think it's just really important to, to focus on the culturally relevant and critically engaged content, right? So we're talking about um, emphasizing social justice, anti-racism, stereotypes, um, really emphasizing the histories of historically marginalized communities um, and promoting students' critical awareness of social issues. Um, and, and I think that you know, it gives students an opportunity to see themselves reflected in the curriculum. So when I talk about that tailoring being an important component, I think that that's a big lesson for other schools that, um, that, sort of, that there has to be some thoughtfulness um, to this. Secondly, the the importance of the supports that the teachers in San Francisco got in creating this curriculum. They were intensely supported. They had um, institutional support from the school district in terms of release time to do curriculum planning and meeting around um, doing this type of um, critically engaged uh, pedagogy, um, right? That That is, that is, atypical, frankly, for, for U.S. schools. And so it does take time and resources and support, uh, I think, to, to deliver um, a high quality experience for students. Um, so those, those are the two sort of things that I want to say that I think are really important lessons. So given the context and your findings, is there anything that policymakers should do? One of the things that, that we're doing, and it speaks to sort of your question about previous lessons, is that I'm working with uh, multiple other researchers. We're looking at ethnic studies being scaled up in ethnic studies. So it's important to remember this was a pilot study. This was sort of their initial um, go at creating ethnic studies in, in the San Francisco Unified School District. And based on the results of the pilot, and the close relationship between the researchers and the school district in being able to share those results, they decided to um, to scale up and offer ethnic studies to many more students. And so we are looking at the scale up of ethnic studies. So as more teachers are teaching, as more students are engaging with the curriculum, uh, what do we sort of see in terms of the impacts there? And there's also a qualitative component to that work, which I can't speak of as much, sort of my specialty being quantitative analysis. But given that work, um, us researchers who've been working with San Francisco have also connected with other school districts that have been doing ethnic studies work um, in the Southwest United States to large districts. And so we're also looking at different facets of trying to under, like really unpack potential mechanisms. What, you know, sort of what is in um, this 
this curriculum, this pedagogical approach that seems to be so impactful. And I think also trying to look at what happens when you when you sort of scale this up. I think, you know, I'm I'm concerned um, because I because I think we know in educational research you kind of have these pilot studies. They're well supported, well funded, um, and you see these impacts, and then people turn around and say, okay, um, let's just do it, and they don't provide the funding and the support. Um, and then are sort of disappointed by the results. And so I think where, where, where my work with my colleagues can come in is try to unpack what are the different facets of the ethnic studies design and implementation that seem to be really critical um, for promoting its success. And we can sort of use that to communicate with practitioners and policymakers around these idealized components. So if in terms of knowing about ethnic studies, sort of we can have a black box sort of intervention and not really know what it is and say it's got to be everything. Um, but we're going to try to sort of dig into that a little bit more and try to be helpful to policymakers and practitioners about what it is they can do um, to, to support students and their engagement with, with, with schooling. And, and I think much more broadly um, in terms of their engagement with um, with 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 society, I think they're sort of teaching students in ethnic studies um, about the importance of social justice and how to promote it, and giving them the tools to be a part of creating a more just world as they see it. And I think that that's just particularly powerful. Um, I think it's also important to note that the course was one year long, so when you when you see a lot of requirements around um, around if you, if you look at AB 101, right, that was just passed, that's a semester course. And so I think it's important to note, to contrast that with this being a year-long course. Um, it targeted students who were transitioning to high school. So I talked about getting that ball rolling down the hill um, and it picking up speed. These students were were in ninth grade and they were just transitioning at a time that, right, is it's, we, we know that ninth grade is a challenging time in terms of academic and social adjustment, and that ethnic studies might be particularly well poised to support students in this transition, um, particularly as they're starting to um, sort of develop their identity, you know, as an adolescent, um, trying to understand what their place is in their community, um, and find their place in school as well, right? So all these th important things are happening, not that they're not happening before, um, but, but certainly this is sort of a pivotal time in students' trajectories um, in terms of their identity development and their academic development. So Dr. Tintian Kokobelis, are there any recommendations that you might make to policymakers or to researchers or to um, educational stakeholders? I really want to appreciate the, the current study um, of my colleagues, because it really does put ethnic studies on the map. A lot of people are now looking at ethnic studies as a means um, for academic achievement for young people. And I, I appreciate that at, at some level. I, I do think that it's it can be dangerous um, for some people to then think that the only way to measure ethnic studies and the success of ethnic studies um, is through test scores and grades um, and attendance. Um, I think that there, there's some challenges to that because ethnic studies, the purpose of ethnic studies is really about the development of young people um, and their wellness um, and really developing their engagement in their communities. And I think that we really want to look deeply about the ways that we can study that. Um, how do we know that ethnic studies is effective in really trying to support young people um, to really understand who they are? Um, I, I've been working with some colleagues on really trying to develop uh, what it means to understand uh, youth wellness. And I think we really want to look at how ethnic studies impacts youth wellness. Um, and when I, when I talk about wellness, I'm really talking about something pretty specific. Um, but wellness sometimes gets co-opted as well, like in, in mainstream communities. Um, but I'm talking about the wellness specifically of students of color um, and the wellness that, that where they feel like they can have this harmony between their mind, body, emotion, and spirit, and where they feel like they can have healthy relationships with people, um, where they feel like uh, they're, um, where, where they feel like that they can um, become self-actualized and community-actualized. 
And so I, I think of, of, of wellness and um, I think about the ways that we need to figure out how to create new measurements for ethnic studies and how, how ethnic studies can impact one's identity, one's inner self, um, and having this real strong sense of culture and agency. Um, I also think about how do we measure how ethnic studies impacts people's relationships with each other. Um, and, and how it teaches young people how to become more empathetic um, towards their communities and towards people who are not in their communities. And then the last thing that I really hope that we figure out how to measure is how do we think about how ethnic studies impacts our interconnectedness um, between our understandings of our histories, our ancestors, our relationship to land, our relationship um, to the natural world. Um, because ethnic studies is more than just grades and test scores. So there are uh, three essential questions. I mean, so I, I'll speak specifically um, to um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Don Buholano Mabalon, um, who was my best friend. Um, so um, it's very personal to me. And she passed away in 2018, but she left us a legacy. Um, she was a historian, an American historian. And um, she was very much trained in ethnic studies, and she wanted to make sure that we understood that ethnic studies had three essential questions. One is, who am I? Um, the second question is, what is the story of my family and my community? And then number three, what can I do to make a positive change and bring social justice to my community and the world? And to me, when I think about those essential questions, some people might find that threatening, um, but those are our rights. It is our right to understand who we are, the story of our people, our story of our family, and then really to figure out how can we make positive change in our communities. And when I think about if I when I think about the way that Don describes um, what ethnic studies is and, and why those questions are important, I think to myself, why would people be so mad and angry about us learning about who we are? About, about us learning about our communities, about us trying to make positive change in our communities. And to me, you know, it is an injustice if someone believes that those things are not our right. So um, when I, I think about all of that and, and I think about then policymakers or um, people who, who are in power um, to be able to make decisions around ethnic studies, I really think that they need to think deeply about what ethnic studies is um, and what it means to communities of color, what it really means um, to, to learn about who we are and, and to not be silenced anymore um, and to not be subservient anymore um, and to really believe in ourselves. One of the central concepts in ethnic studies is self-determination. And that is scary to some people. Um, and I think that, that that is uncomfortable for some people, for people of color to speak out Sometimes people look at me as an Asian American woman or a Filipina or a Pinay, um, and they're like, yeah, you're really vocal, you know, like as though I shouldn't be. Um, and I think it's really important also to think about how ethnic studies allows us the opportunity um, to challenge the ways that we're supposed to be or stereotyped to be. Um, and I think part of it means that, um, that that may take power away from other people. Um, and the people need, those people in power need to also question, you know, like this redistribution of power and, and ethnic studies is really important in, in, in leading us there. Thank you again to Dr. Tintianko Kubalis and Dr. Bonilla for being on this month's episode. As always, thank you for listening. We hope that you're safe and healthy. And remember that for the latest analysis on education policy, you should subscribe to the NEPC newsletter at nepc.colorado.edu. And follow NEPC on Twitter at NEPC Tweet.